Good evening, Good evening everyone. Everyone. Time, time to have another update. update. We're going to spend some time on the technicals of this chart and uh, then we're going to look at a story and then we're going to look at the 2017 Lunar Rooster series. But uh, I wanted to go into depth on the silver chart. Now we had a pretty big move today. Um, roughly the recent spike is from about 1875 and we got almost to uh, say 2020 so a, a big move and it, there's still some action after hours we'll come and follow up with this on the minute chart but I wanted you to look at the eight hour chart here and point out some things here so first of all we want to uh, take notice of the MACD confirmations by signal cell signal so, as I pointed out many times in the past, MACD buy signals are only valid in bull markets, and MACD sell signals are only valid in bear markets. Sideways market, that gives you false positives and false negatives and basically worthless information. So you can see as we start off, this goes back about 14 months or so, back to July of last year. And you can see that where we start in this series, we have uh, a number of false signals. Uh, the first signal that I've, the arrows are, are pointing to the signals here. The first signal that we have here is a false sell signal. And you can see that we got a spike in the MACD and then a breakdown. And that coincided with this top here. Let me put the arrows in so I can use those. So that coincided with this right here. Now you can see that that was followed by a higher price here. So that's a bad signal. Now this buy signal was uh, one that many people would have taken when it crossed over here or when it crossed the zero line. There's a couple of ways you can play it. You can play it on just when it crosses and reverses or as we'll see here in a minute when we get further into the series, that uh, a break through the zero line is actually a better signal. But you can see we got a buy signal there. Uh, but that buy signal actually ended up being superseded by a lower price uh, all the way back out to December. So it took a while, but that signal failed. Uh, the next sell, sell signal that we got was right here. And you can see that it seemed to be valid until we got the next sell signal, which is here, and uh, it, it just didn't continue. So ultimately, this sell signal failed. So all three of these are failed signals. Now, the buy signal we got right here uh, was, it, it could be considered to be valid, but we got lower prices. So I would say that that was a bad signal as well. So we're talking about sideways market action here. Now, the buy signal that we got that was valid is actually what I mentioned before, was when we got a buy signal that broke through the zero line. And, and this, this buy signal is the least dramatic of any of the buy signals that we had. But you can see it was the buy signal that started this uptrend. And that's the main trend line that we're still on. Now we've got a secondary trend line that, where we are accelerating, but this is still the main trend line. Now that buy signal is still valid to this day and that was uh, all the way back in January. You can see that we got a buy signal right here which coincided with this price. That's a higher price. We bought. The price went higher. Now it just went incrementally higher when we look at the next buy signal which came in right there but it's still a valid signal. Uh, we got a rising price, we got a sell signal here. Now we don't even need to talk about these because uh, they're totally invalid. So we've already got one, two, three valid buy signals. Now here's the fourth, we get another buy signal here. And boom, we get higher prices. We actually get a blast off in prices, which gives us our sell signal. And this brings us up to today. So we've already gotten one, actually one, 
two, three, four valid buy signals in a row. And the big question is going to be, is this the fifth valid one? Now what it's going to require for this to be the fifth valid buy signal and for this to be a continuous bull market is I'm thinking in the next couple of days we need to get through this line and we need to get through this high and we need to do it uh, probably before we top this spike top here because that's a sell signal and we're not near that yet if we top here and go down then that gives us two valid sell signals in a row and that uh, terminates the validity of this buy signal so the next couple of days are going to be really critical to see if it can power through the resistance. There's not a lot of resistance. I'm going to take us out to the a longer term chart, but first I want to point out some other things here. Um, the the breakout that we have here, you can see that we had a breakout, this violent spike here, and then a retracement, and then a, a stronger move. Uh, this is the original breakout point of this this cup and saucer or pennant or whatever you want to call it. And what I want you to note is that we did not correct back to it. What we corrected back to was this high, the initial high that we got when we broke out. That's very bullish. Uh, normally, you're going to come all the way back to the support that was there. If you don't come back to the support, if buyers come in before you get back to the support, then what that means is that people are trying to anticipate each other and they're trying to pick the bottom and they fall, fall all over each other trying to get in. And that's what happened here. So that's very bullish that we did not test that technical support level, but we just tested this technical support level. Now we're on our way up, but again, for us to get the fifth valid buy signal, we're going to need a move within the next two days, at least taking out this trend line and most likely taking out this high, because you can see that this MACD is moving up very rapidly. It's not going to take much longer for this to either top or to be higher than this one. So time is of the essence, and we're talking about a 20 two dollar price target if this occurs so let's go further out in the series here and look at the daily you can see same sort of thing very good buy signal there uh, seems to be the resumption of a bull market a nice new low on the MACD but the price is very very strong that's what you want to see you want to see the momentum uh, the moving average, all those things reset, but the price staying strong. That's exactly what we're seeing. Now, I was pointing out the resistance that we have. It's not a lot because this whole area of resistance, you can see just the, the dashed blue line, all of this price action here, this is below our current price. So the real resistance is up here at this, this, and this. And those are actually significantly higher than our current price which is very very bullish as well because that means that between us and 22 there really isn't too much there wasn't too much trading we're above most of the trading and uh, it wouldn't be surprising at all to get that quick jump to tw through 21 to 22 if we get to 22 then we've taken this out we've taken this out and it really just leaves a little bit here so I'm about, I would say, 60 to 70% bullish on the next few days' action, thinking that we're probably going to get a move through those prices. You can see we're correcting now down. We're in the 19s. It was a very, very strong move. Let's move to the five minute. The market's kind of in a digestion phase right now. So you can see it's trying to digest the gains that we just had. And it's looking pretty bearish, this type of reversal here. It's looking pretty bearish on the short term. So that's what we're going to be watching. Um, and then we're going to look again and see if that, what, 
how that buy signal and sell signal formation lines up after we get whatever we get in the next two days. So let's look at this story from Zero Hedge and then we're going to talk about the 2017 rooster. This is a really important story because the economy that we have in this country right now and perhaps a lot of countries in the world is a very, very centrally controlled economy. And what happens when you have that sort of economy is that everybody is totally vulnerable, not only to uh, arbitrary and uh, centralized decisions, but they're also subject to political risk. They're subject to risk that has to do with pleasing certain groups. And uh, I'm not saying that's what's behind this. I really don't know. We have a background of colleges that have been partners with the government in essentially fleecing generations of our youth by promising something that they can't deliver. Now, this is certainly not something that applies only to ITT. And we had, I think it was First Corinthian was another one that shut down. The entire college game is a scam. And anybody who did even the tiniest amount of homework would see that the jobs that are out there for the degrees are not what is being promised to the students. And it's on the students and their parents for being so stupid and gullible to purchase something that has no value. But at the same time, um, these technical schools were in a different space than the traditional university college um, companies, we'll say. So there's a couple of new factors here. The online colleges is a very new factor and it's causing competition, but there's also these trade schools slash technical schools. Now I'm actually in this sort of field and I know from my history that the stuff that I do with networking with companies like Cisco and Juniper and advanced routing and switching, that these things weren't available. It didn't matter whether you went to a doctorate level. There were no courses in college that had any of this information. So if you wanted to become knowledgeable about how the internet works and how uh, all the communication, the modern communication that has to do with the internet uh, and, and uh, networking in companies works, you would have to get certifications from these particular vendors, whether it be Cisco, Microsoft, Juniper, uh, there's a ton of them out there. There were some that came online with CompTIA, A+, Network+, Plus Series, I got a couple of those, and then there were the Cisco certifications, Juniper certifications. It was only later in the game that some of these schools like ITT and others came in to fill the void where the colleges had not covered any of this stuff and, and made uh, the knowledge that they were passing to their students make them employable. But now we've got one of these sort of trade schools, now it's collapsing. And so it, it's an important story for both of those aspects, the fact that uh, the technical schools are now losing, uh, they're losing their funding, and that uh, just the whole college thing is turning down. So let's read a little bit of this. The long-running tragic saga of ITT Education Services, which was established nearly 50 years ago and operates the ITT Technical Institute, a for-profit college chain finally came to an end this morning with both a bang and a whimper when it announced that it is shutting down effective immediately, leaving the fate of 40,000 students currently enrolled in limbo and some 8,000 workers without a job. The company said the closure is due to an investigation and sanctions by the U.S. Department of Education. Quote, it is with profound regret that we must report that ITT Educational Services, Inc. will discontinue academic operations at all of its ITT technical institutes permanently 
after approximately 50 years of continuous service, the company stated Tuesday. Effective today, the company has eliminated the positions of the overwhelming majority of our more than 8,000 employees. As previously reported, ITT Tech stopped enrolling new students on August 29th, just a few days after it was cut off from a significant amount of federal funding by the government. ITT's collapse was catalyzed when the Department of Education effectively killed the company two weeks ago when it told the company on August 25th that it couldn't enroll new students who use federal financial aid. The school accused federal officials of forcing the closure and denying it due process. The company has been the subject of state and federal probes for various reasons, including its recruitment tactics, lending practices, and job placement figures. Now, there you have it. Now, this indictment against them could be applied to every single college that you could name. You could take a survey of incoming freshmen asking them what type of fields they plan to study in and what the job placement rate is. I think the only ones that would have even a realistic view are the ones who intentionally plan to go into the STEM, uh, which is that that's the science and mathematic, mathematics area, engineering, etc. The ones who intend to do that and plan to get a job in that area, uh, then, of course, you could probably talk about people going into medicine. That's currently something that uh, the government is paying for all of that. But you can see how quickly the government can pull the rug out from underneath you. This is essentially what you have. In, it's, it's not pure communism, but it's very, very close so that if you're running an establishment that depends on a tremendous amount of government money there's any number of ways that someone can torpedo your business. Now, the fact that ITT was in business for 50 years, I seriously doubt that they started out that way. You have to remember that the college uh, student loan situation was not the same 50 years ago as it is today, and even 20 years ago. Back then, many of the student loans were private loans, and those loans were not guaranteed, and those loans didn't have any collateral, but they had a, reason, a reasonably high interest rate to compensate these private lenders for the risk. Now, what happened is that the government basically took over all the lending, so there really isn't a way to get private loans anymore. It's just government grants and government loans. So what that means is if you run one of these educational institutions, you have to tow the government line. Now, I'm not sure what happened behind the scenes here. Uh, certainly the accusation about recruitment, lending practices, and job placement figures, that applies to virtually all of the colleges, universities, uh, technical colleges, online colleges. They're all lying. Uh, that's the only way they can get those enormous numbers. And if you look at the number here, 8,000 employees, 8,000 employees, okay, the first thing that you should look at is the fact that you have 40,000 enrolled students and 8,000 employees. Now, that should tell you right away with that type of ratio that you don't have an economically viable situation going on there, that you have a 5 to 1 ratio. There's no reason to have that type of ratio. You do not need 8,000 employees to teach 40,000 students. But when you're living on the government gravy train and you can find reasons to increase all those things, that's what happens. So that's the story. We're going to be watching this. I think it's going to possibly be a domino effect, but we don't know at this point. Uh, there's a very, very large union um, union-based uh, constituency of people working for the government, working for the colleges, and that's a very large voting block. Certainly, I would say probably 80 to 90 percent a Democrat voting block. Um, so if Trump gets in there, what's going to happen? Don't know. Uh, it could be very, very interesting. So let's jump over to the, the Rooster series and this is one that I'm kind of torn about. Now, I did do a uh, search on this, and I did find someone selling the 
the half ounce roosters for 1250 and that's pretty reasonable with silver being at about 20 bucks right now about a five dollar premium per ounce if i can find those i would probably snap them up right away I, but i don't know that's like a pre-sale that i saw on ebay for just one coin so i don't know how much validity that has uh, gainesville coin has them coming soon same thing with atmex so that ebay coin was the only one that uh, i could find that had a price on it so where are they going to come out uh, i also found a australian site that gave some prices in australian dollars they look pretty reasonable somewhere around 12 to 13 dollars for the half ounce and um, maybe twice that or a little bit more for the one ounce so we're going to see where that comes out one thing that you have to keep in mind is that they're still capped at this 300,000 figure for the one ounce that 300,000 figure has been in place for the Perth Lunar Series 2 for quite some time and as the years go by that becomes a smaller number just because the population becomes larger the number of investors becomes larger and that number is fixed so that's bullish uh, in the sense that uh, that makes the coins more rare. My guess is that uh, that this rooster is going to start around maybe 45 to 50 bucks. That's just a, a guess. Maybe even 60. We'll have to wait and see on the one ounce. Now, as to the design, I'm somewhat torn. At first, when I saw this, I liked the design and I was uh, pretty positive on it. That was until I saw the 2005 Lunar Series 1 rooster and when I look at this coin it's just like wow that's a fantastic coin I don't consider this coin now you have the Lunar Series 2 has had that uh, dull silver look as opposed to the bright look that the Lunar Series 1 had I, I have not tended to prefer that Lunar Series 1 look, except on this coin, I definitely prefer that look. I I think that the Lunar Series 1 rooster is far superior than the Lunar Series 2. Uh, these are going for about 109 bucks, about 110 bucks a coin, uh, whether it's eBay or Atmex or whatever. So that being said, I do not like the Lunar Series 2 nearly as much as the Lunar Series 1, but at the same time, I do like the coin. Uh, for me, it's about on par with the monkey or the goat. It's nothing spectacular for me. For me, the the dragon was very, very important for the symbolism of it, but also for the design. The horse for me was really a key coin because of the design. So for for me, this one's just kind of um similar to the ones we've been seeing so what would i say how would i recommend to play this one personally i'm going to play this one where if i see 12 to 13 dollar half ounce coins on this um, then that would be a buy if we get a big drop in the price of silver which i'm suspecting we're not going to get but uh, if we get a big drop in price then maybe the 11 dollar range if I see the one ounce going for $30, I might be tempted. Certainly 27 or below, I would definitely consider buying the one ounce coin, um, but not much more than that. A $7 premium is about as high as I want to go on the coin. If I really, really like the coin, like I like the Series 1, I would go up to 30 maybe $10 above spot, but... So for me, the price points are going to be, if we see $27 on the one ounce, and if we see under $13 on the half ounce, then I'll be considering buying the coin. So back to the silver chart, uh, it's going to be an interesting day tomorrow. The market's really, really active right now, and you can see that it's trying to form that uh, pennant where it's, it's tested that 2012 price twice now it wants to go higher but uh, we'll just have to wait and see if the volume comes in we don't have a lot of time to get a confirmation of this price pattern that i pointed out this this series of 
ascending buys has been in place essentially since January. As soon as the year, the new year came around, we got that buy signal. Very subtle, hard to even pick up. But it was when we got that break through the zero line and prices just started to gradually rise and kept rising. We got that buy signal right when that happened and we got one, uh, we got number two, number three, number four, and now we're on number five. We're gonna see if this one continues the pattern. And we'll talk to you next time.